one regarded as arguably the biggest titan in the technology world at a time when the industry was picking up. As one of the pioneers of some of the modern-day phones we use, Motorola should be up there like the likes of iPhone and Samsung. But it isn't. Motorola's story is one full of several ups and downs, twists and heart-racing events that made the world take note. Though complex and perplexing, Motorola's rise at its peak made several people wonder why it failed. For one, Motorola was characterized by a labyrinth of decision-making, with most of them leading to a dead end. In this video, we will take you on a trip down history lane, looking at the pivotal moments that went on to define Motorola's journey, its rise and fall, from groundbreaking inventions in the mobile tech world to missed opportunities and severe market share decline. This is the story of Motorola. The history of Motorola can be traced back to 1928 in Chicago, Illinois. Paul Galvin had an idea to make radios portable and install them in cars. So he and his brother Joseph bought a recently bankrupted radio technology for only $750. They named their newly founded company Galvin Manufacturing Corporation. Soon after, Paul Galvin felt a new name for the brand's foremost products was needed. A name that would represent Galvin Manufacturing Corporation's new car radio. So they came up with the name Motorola, which was gotten by liking motor, as in motor car, with Ola from Victrola, which was at the time a common ending for several companies like Crayola and Malviola. Two years after the company was formed, it made its first sale on June 23, 1930, to a man named Herbert C. Wall from Fort Wayne. For a sum of $30, from there on, the brand went on to become so popular that Paul and Joseph Galvin changed the name to Motorola Incorporation in 1947. 21 years after it was founded, after achieving initial success on its earliest plan, Motorola's next step was to manufacture portable signal receivers for the police force. Knowing that successfully achieving this would be a huge catalyst for nationwide adoption, and further growth of the company. After Junior's success, the company transitioned into manufacturing large screen TVs, FM appliances, and then mobile phones. Yet, its groundbreaking innovations was yet to come. It was the first ever transceiver capable of use in space and was signed to any mobile technology that appeared at the time. During the late 1970s, Motorola entered the mobile phone market one of its very first products, the iconic Dynatech 8000, was launched in 1984. At the time, it was the world's first ever flip phone. Motorola was determined to capture the market, so it didn't stop there. They followed up a new product, the Microtac, in 1989. And then the world's lightest and smallest clamshell flip phone called StarTac in 1996. At this point, Motorola was pretty unstoppable. They continued employing new phones and building large factories as well, as making huge investments in quality solutions. Managing to establish the Six Sigma standard and ensuring that 99% of its products came without defects. The next step for Motorola was to enter the Asian market with China. While the largest mobile phone companies focused on China before entering the international market, Motorola didn't follow that path initially. Though difficult, Motorola eventually managed to convince the Chinese government to allow them to build some manufacturing factories there. This move allowed them to reduce their costs significantly, but the price eventually turned out to be higher than they thought. Chinese manufacturing companies were beginning to get familiar with the production standards of the Western world. Motorola's influence was immense, thousands of Chinese suppliers starting adopting Motorola's practices. Some of these companies were state-owned, and most of them had second-tier and third-tier suppliers. To understand how huge Motorola's influence in China was, one could argue that it played the most significant role in China's economic growth. At the time, Motorola divided its operation into two sub-companies, Motorola Solutions, which was in charge of the communications and Motorola Mobility, which was responsible for its mobile phone division. Both sub-companies operated independently of each other. 
However, they aligned only in critical matters. Till today, many consider the decision to split the companies in two as the start of its downfall. Due to the rise of Nokia, another massive company in the history of mobile phones, Motorola shares started dropping, giving Nokia more control of the market. At the end of 1997, when Gary Tucker's CEO tenor expired, Nokia became the world's leading mobile phone manufacturer. As a result, Chris Galvin, the grandson of founder Paul Galvin, was brought in to try and stabilize the company and return it to its leading market position. Chris was a Kellogg MBA and knew the company as much as anyone. Having spent the last two decades working his way up the company's ladder, his father had built for him. When Chris took over, he inherited a bureaucratic Goliath, comprising 60 separate businesses around the world, nearly all of them weak. Prior to Chris's takeover, the company experienced a large setback in the late 1980s. During the time, space obsession was an order of things. Millions of dollars were invested in space exploration. Communication technologies were key to mobile phone companies and their effects were soon rewarded with the birth of the Iridium project, which consisted of 77 network satellites that would ensure mobile phones coverage anytime and anywhere traditional technology fell short. The goal was to ensure wireless phone service connected the entire world. The technology needed for the satellites to be used was manufactured and provided by Motorola with a worth of $2.6 billion. The project which took over a decade to be developed, failed miserably in 1998. Iridium could only work with really expensive phones that start at $3,000 apiece. But that wasn't all. A minute of use cost $7. As a result of this market failure, Iridium went bankrupt after just nine months, prompting Motorola to sell off as just 1% of its original cost. As if the setback wasn't enough, 9-11 also caused a huge market decline for Motorola. Both events, coupled with the SARS scare, resulted in a 4 billion loss for Motorola. Out of desperation, Galvin went as far as firing one-third of 150,000 Motorola workers. Several plants were shut down, including their main plant in Harvard, Illinois, worth over $90 million. This, however, was still not enough to save the tech giants. Chris then had to turn to other options and instead invested his hopes in the latest digital-ready Razer phone. This device was quite thin and made almost completely of metal. Sadly, Motorola couldn't stay on the market long enough to see a grandiose phone get launched. By 2003, Galvin family decided to give up and sell their 3% share of the company for just $720 million. One of the most brutal truths of the corporate world is the peculiarity of the executive luck. As David Garfield, a managing director at Chicago management consulting firm Alex's partner, said an executive who inherits a very challenging situation and makes a lot of the right moves can turn out a runaway before he or she is able to gain sufficient altitude. Sometimes a successor gets the benefit. In Chris Galvin's case, it seemed he had an uncannily tragic exit of luck. A life away from Motorola company served Galvin. Figuring out how to make good use of freed up funds led Galvin to his current career. He and his brother Michael, with help from a partner, founded a venture capital firm on South Wacker Drive named Harrison Street in honor to the first address of Galvin Manufacturing. Harrison Street primarily invests in real estate and software businesses. It's the firm to apply the principles of Six Sigma to the real estate business, Galvin says. So Galvin's bad executive luck didn't linger around for too long. However, his leaving the company might have been ill-timed. Nas thinks to quite a climatic turn after just three months. Razer was a monumental success. As a measly 50 million phones were sold in two years. As of 2004, Motorola's market share rose to an astounding $42 billion. And the new president, Ed Zander, was lauding the success of Galvin's idea. It was official. Razer was the second best mobile phone on the planet 
and one of the 20 best mobile phones to ever be invented. Previously, the COO of the trailblazing computer company, Sun Microsystems. Currently owned by Oracle, Xander was an expert corporate showman, known for entertaining the prep and humor. At a leadership seminar right after he took the job at Motorola, Xander equipped to the audience about how he cried on the first day after inheriting the company. Because of just how slow-moving and blind it was to see the convergence of telecommunication technologies. The success of Razer certainly did a great job of putting Sanders' tears on hold. In no time, Motorola began earning billions in cash. In only the first two years in charge, the stock price doubled. Sander did what any executive would consider the present Razer success, ride it as long as possible. There were a dizzying array of different colors and shapes with barely any new features. The big carriers asked for it, said Xander, who currently sits on several boards. However, it didn't take long for Zandler's impressive run of success and luck at the company to fade out. In perhaps one of the worst decisions ever made by a corporate CEO, Xander reached a deal with Fried at Silicon Valley Steve Jobs, the head of Apple, and manufactured the Motorola Rocker. Rocker was made using the hardware technology of Apple, iTunes, and Motorola as you'd expect. The phone was an absolute success. But it didn't just break Motorola's way. We can't think of a more natural partnership than this one with Apple. Xander said at the time, branded the Rocker, the mobile device was officially launched in the fall of 05. Jobs who launched it praised it off as an iPod shuffle right on your phone. Xander and Motorola had neglected all initial efforts to keep competition away. It had just taught the savviest and most dangerous competitor on the market how to make a successful phone. In 2007, Apple ended its partnership with Motorola and launched the very first iPhone. The groundwork for it, nothing other than Motorola's Razor. When Apple introduced the iPhone, Motorola was still producing Razors, pumping sales up by taking new variants further and further down market. The outcome of this lower profit margins an analyst estimated that the supposed tech giants earned, on average, just about $5 per mobile phone. Partially due to the huge layoffs of the previous year, Motorola's innovation machine stalled. The company had a long run among the top 10 leading American firms registering US patents, reveals analyst Joan Lappin. As of 2006, the company dropped all the way to number 34, Xander rather take the responsibility for the dreaded decline, insisted that he saw the smartphone descent coming. But Motorola neither had the DNA nor the people to comprehend the software involved. He also blamed a less than swift Motorola supplier that, according to him, caused the tech giants to miss almost a year in the product cycle. We should have just broken the contract, he says. He even revealed that his only regret was that he didn't take himself after the CEO role and run Motorola's phone division himself. Xander's time as CEO would be remembered for missed opportunities. For one, he failed to engage with China as much as his forerunners and left the division heads to deal the job. China had improved its network to 3G, while Motorola was still stuck in the past producing 2G phones. In the end, the company had to offer their devices at steep discounts just so they could remain on the market. Other companies like Samsung and Huawei also used the opportunity to offer cheaper mobile phones and in no time, they had already taken over the Asian market. At that point, there was nothing Motorola could do to compete any longer. Xander's questionable performance led Motorola to yet another dismal ride of passage for many once-honored American firms. An invasion from Wall Street In Motorola's unfortunate case, this invasion came in the form of Carl Icahn, the man Fortune once hailed as the shrewdest investor on the planet. Much of his lucrative 20 billion plus fortune comes from extraordinary ability to not only see, but exploit the untapped wealth within companies that have frail leaders. Xander dropped the leadership position at Motorola in 2008. In the following year, Motorola's mobile market share had sunk even further to an incredible 6%. The next rescue attempt at the company came from Carl Icahn. He popped into the picture in 2007, 
and bought 3.6 of the firm. The first move he made was to divide the two company divisions into individual firms. Motorola's reshaped board picked Greg Brown, who had led the latter business since 2003, as the new CEO. An extremely polished individual with a calming baritone, who sits on a number of boards. Including the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, Brown had one run the software company Micromuse, so he had the much-needed experience. He kept the corners of Micromuse steadily profitable, ensuring high margins, and had a quality that mattered highly to Icon. But what really mattered was that Brown could see the potential Icon also so. Finding someone who could and was willing to run Motorola's dismal phone business proved arduous. There were only a few people in the world who could do it, Icon says. They all said no because they didn't want to be anything but a CEO, and Motorola already had a CEO. The phone market was moments away from slipping off anyway, Icon reasoned. So he finally decided that the board hired a co-CEO to work beside Brown. Any idea Brown warmed up to? And Sanjay Jha, a previous Qualcomm CEO, who had a deep understanding of both the hardware and the software sides of telecom, was chosen for the position of co-CEO. Jha's package would eventually net Icon close to $60 million over the next three years. The board needed him, Icon explained. The Indian-born, UK-educated engineer stepped into a marketing organization that was entirely disconnected from what was going on in the market. On the second day at Motorola in August 2008, says Ja, I did a portfolio review of all the company's phones. I sat there for three hours and looked at everything, flabbergasted. There were no smartphones. Ja took charge however he could. He called for a meeting with the engineers to see just how modern they were. I was told that Motorola actually developed and patented a lot of the stuff's company's phones. Didn't have. Ja said the company was the first with QWERTY keypad, with color screens, with 3G and touch, but very few Motorola phones had these features. The only way to stop Motorola's from running through revenue, Ja decided, was to cut both cost and the number of mobile phones manufactured. At Motorola, about 60 managers worked on dozens of varying models. Apple, on the other hand, heaped all its ingenuity into perfecting one mobile phone. Ja discovered that he had one shot of saving Motorola's phone business. Making a successful device for Verizon, which was also scrambling to compete with AT&T, the exclusive seller of iPhone then. First, Ja had to figure out what operating system to put it all on. Motorola's five and company systems just couldn't make the cut. None were sophisticated enough to make with the iPhones. Ja revealed that Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft, presumed that he would go with Windows Mobile. Steve told that I ought to devote 400 engineers to a Windows Mobile phone, he says. I told him that Microsoft's success wasn't my priority. I needed first to survive and did not have the resources to put even one engineer on it. Ballmer, however, couldn't be reached by the press at that time. The pressure was extreme. Engineers informed Ja, who still had to commute between his home in San Diego and Motorola's head office in Schamburg, that they wouldn't be able to complete the new model before the spring of 2010, while Verizon had demanded a device by October 2009. In the meantime, his division was losing about $600 million per quarter, more desperate now than ever. Ja chopped an additional 4,000 jobs. The cuts overwhelmed Motorola's already shortened pool of engineers. Iqbal Arshad, who had considerable experience attempting to get Nokia's Symbian smartphones OS onto Motorola's devices overseas, was all but ready to quit. Apparently, having his laps in Europe shut down and losing his team was too much of a loss for the engineer to remain at Motorola. Ja, however, was able to convince him to reconsider. On a flight back from Europe with Ja, Arshad prepared a presentation for the x back in Schamburg. The plan, with the moniker Mission Impossible, was to develop a device on Google's new Android OS. It would be just a second such phone on the market at the time, but it wouldn't all go as Arshad and Ja had wanted. The presentation held in Schamburg in 2009 grew hated. One Motorola executive declared that picking Android over Microsoft Windows 
was a travesty. Google's system wasn't yet prepared for prime time, he argued, whereas Microsoft, on the other hand, was one of the leading software companies in the world. Ja, however, wouldn't budge. Motorola's board was faced with two alternatives, go with Ja and Arshad's recommendation, or just shut down the mobile phone business completely. After a vote of 4-3, to three, the board members decided on the former, almost immediately. Arshad designates a team of 200 in company engineers to work pretty close with Google team, with Andy Rubin at the helm, the man who created the Android system. They wanted Motorola to be successful and prove everyone wrong, says Arshad. To save the company, and exactly, this they did for a while. The new mobile device called the Droid, a name licensed by Verizon from the director George Lucas, who had initially coined it for Star Wars, hit the market officially in October 2009. In the Droid's first month, through the holidays, Motorola distributed more than them than Apple's iPhone did. Jar revealed by late 2010. After about four long years of massive loses, Motorola's phone division was profitable once more. For age-old Motorolans, however, this success was bittersweet. Droid, while successful, wasn't just the world-changing invention Motorola was known for. The company had known and shown the world how to make great Android phones. In almost no time, Motorola's old rivals, particularly Samsung, were once back again at the top. By 2011, when Motorola spit almost three years after Carl Icahn's legendary activism began, and much later than the executives had anticipated, Red Ink had found its way back onto their phone's division balance sheet. Some months after the cleaving of Motorola's mobility from Motorola Solutions, Google began making moves to buy the former. At this time, Google was slowly easing into the hardware business. But the real prize here was Motorola Mobility portfolio of nearly 17,000 patents. Mainly created in the older ways of rapid innovation, the acquire intellectual property would make place Google in a better position to defend itself against a looming series of patent lawsuits over the telecom market. For Icon, Ja, Brown, the bulk of Motorola's mobility shareholders, the deal officially announced in 2011, was nothing but financial deliverance. The Silicon Valley guys offered $40 per shareholder, a whooping 63% premium over the market price for Motorola Mobility stock as of 2011. The overall cost was $12.5 billion. Google took charge in May 2012, announcing that they planned to run Motorola as an entirely separate business. Ja left Motorola immediately and took over as the leading semiconductor maker of global foundries. Larry Page, Google chief, replaced Ja with Dennis Woodside, Google's former head of sales and operations in the Americas. Woodside did what any sane head would do, brought in a clear state of executives, several from Silicon Valley, and with that came the end of Motorola, a slow but inevitable fall from grace. If you enjoyed watching this video, do leave a like and subscribe to this channel for more interesting stories and hidden secrets.